All right, so we're going to talk about directional derivatives for the next couple of videos. Um, we'll start with, uh, with a definition and some interpretation. Then we'll get to deriving a formula for it. We'll do maybe one or two computational examples. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on from there. Um, so the, the definition, we already went over it in class, but just to remind you of the definition. So the, the ingredients here, what we're given is we're given the following ingredients. We have a, uh, a function, and it should be at the very least differentiable. And probably we want C1, so continuously differentiable. So some differentiable function. Call it F, a point, let's say A, B, and that's going to be in the domain of F. And we need a unit vector. So let's call it maybe U. Uh, so let's call it maybe u1, u2. Okay. Um, now I'm doing this in two variables, but everything translates exactly as you would expect to three variables. You just add one more coordinate to your point. You add one more component to your vector, um, and you continue as you would expect. Um, so given these ingredients, we can define the the derivative of f at a b in the direction of u is given by. Um, so first we'll do we'll do the notation. So let me underline it. So derivative of f at a b in the direction. It's a long, it's quite a long wordy thing, or directional derivative. Uh, so the derivative of f in the direction of u at our point, it's given by the following formula. So it's d for derivative, the vector u for our direction. Derivative of f in the direction of u at the point a b. And we define this as a limit. So the limit as h goes to 0, f of a plus h u1, b plus h u2, minus f of a b over h. Okay? So we give this limit definition. And a few things to think about with this limit definition. One is that, well, you know, if you think back, we tried something like this early on when we thought about, well, let's you know, see about how do you actually define a derivative for a function of several variables. And we tried to write down something like this, and we realized that it doesn't really make sense because that limit ends up depending on you know, how you approach the point a, b. And so what you're doing in the directional derivative is you're actually specifying a direction. You're saying, okay, well, we're going to approach the point AB along this particular straight line path. And we're going to see what comes out of that limit. And so, of course, the, this is highly dependent on the path that you choose. It depends on these parameters, U1 and U2. It depends on the direction, right? In particular, we can note that... Uh, If you take u to be uh, 1, 0, so if you like the, the unit vector i, then you get that the derivative of f at a, b in the direction of u is just the partial derivative with respect to x at a, b. Okay? Um, and, you know, let's actually just call that i. Why not? And similarly, 
if you did the derivative in the direction of j, you get the y derivative, right? Um, so you should think of, of the partial derivatives as just being special directional derivatives, right? They're, the partial derivatives are directional derivatives that are <coughs> adapted to our coordinate system, right? Um, so, so the ij unit vectors are special because they, they point in the directions for our two coordinates, let's say x and y, point in the direction that those vary. Um, but, you know, you could change your coordinate system. You could rotate your frame of reference and maybe approach along a different line. Um, the way you describe your function, of course, might also change. Um, but these directional derivatives, what they, what they allow you to do is, is compute something like a partial derivative if you were going to rotate your coordinate axes. Um, you can still calculate that derivative along some other direction without having to go through the trouble of doing a change of variables and rewriting your function or doing any of that. Um, you can just use this definition. Uh, of course, nobody likes using a limit definition to calculate derivatives, so you want to find some better way of doing that. And fortunately, there is a theorem. And the theorem says this. It says, for any continuously differentiable function f, and for any unit vector u, we have the following formula. The, you know what, let's switch up our colors, why not? I don't know, I have these colors, I should use them. The derivative of f in the direction of u at a, b, is given by, it's given by the gradient of f at a b dot product with u, which is a pretty straightforward formula. It's a pretty simple formula if you think about it. We, we know how to calculate gradients, right? You just take the partial derivatives and you plug them in. We know how to do dot products. We've known those since first year. Um, so this puts us uh, in pretty solid footing. We've got a nice formula that we can work with to to compute our derivatives. Um, how do you see that this formula is true? Well, there's a few ways to do it. Um, in class, I showed you one way to kind of think about unpacking the definition of differentiability, um, where, again, you kind of look at a limit along certain directions. Um, but here's, here's one way that you can, uh, you can prove that this is true. All right, we don't do too many proofs in this course, but this one's not so bad, so I think it's worth seeing. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to let r of t equal t, sorry, um, a, getting ahead of myself, a plus t u1, b plus t u2, where again I'm using u1 and u2 as my components for the vector, just like I have over there. And we're going to let h of t be the composition, f of r of t. Okay? Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate h prime in two different ways. Now realize that h, h is just a real valued function of one variable. So if I wanted to calculate the derivative of this, this is a usual calc one derivative, and and we know what we know what the limit definition is for the derivative in one variable. Um, on the one hand, h prime of well, I don't want to do any old t. I'm going to do just one particular t value, h prime at zero. Y at zero, well, notice where you are. So, so by the way, this is a parametric curve, but it's, it's a parameterization of a straight line. It's a straight line that goes through the point AB, and it happens to reach that point AB exactly when T is equal to zero. I want to know what's going on at that point AB, so I want to know what's going on when T equals zero. So H prime of zero will be the limit as H goes to zero of H of, oh, I really shouldn't have called it H. 
Um, or maybe I should use a different variable here. Um, yeah, let's use a different variable there. That's going to be less erasing for me. Limit, um, well, let's use t. Do I want to do t? Let's do t. Limit as t goes to 0, h of t minus h of 0 over t. Okay? So, well, let's plug in our function and see what we get. So this is going to be the limit as, oops, again, t. So used to writing h. Limit as t goes to 0 of, so it's going to be, f of r of t. So f at a plus t u1, b plus t u2, minus f, or h of 0. So h of 0 is f of r of 0, but like I said, r of 0 is just the point a, b. Over t, right? And aside from the fact that I'm using t rather than h, you'll notice that this is exactly the definition of the directional derivative, right? Um, so, on the other hand, there's another way that I can, uh, I can compute this. If I use the chain rule, I know that h prime of 0 is the gradient of f at r of 0 dot product with r prime at 0, okay? But r of 0 is just the point a, b, and what's r prime of 0? Well, r prime of t for any t is just u1, u2. r prime of 0 is the vector u. Okay? And that gives you the formula.